All right, this video is going to be kind of uh, of an entire different nature. I want to just share my thoughts and insights about the automotive industry and cars and manufacturers. Um, and even though I don't work for Volkswagen anymore, I want to do it in a way that um, doesn't discredit Volkswagen. And, and I'm kind of making this video almost with the guess or assumption that, you know, my old manager and director and vice president are going to watch this. And I want to still be able to see them on the street and not feel like I've betrayed Volkswagen with what I've seen and learned there. Um, but I'm also going to be honest and try and explain the differences between um, the three major automotive manufacturers, the Americans, the Japanese, and the Germans. And I would say the Koreans more or less fall into the Japanese category. Uh, and just share my insights. This is one man's opinion, so it's worth about that much. But I started as a mechanic working on everything that came in the door bumper to bumper, American cars, Japanese cars, Korean cars, German cars. And then I spent 17 years uh, at Volkswagen. I spent three years working at world headquarters in Germany, living in Germany. And I worked uh, as an engineer, I worked as a mechanic, I worked in quality assurance and I worked in engineering. And in my last job, um, one of the things we did was competitor analysis. So we would um, purchase cars or rent cars from competitors and analyze them to see what they were doing better than us or worse than us, where we could improve or where we could save money. So, um, yeah, so that's that's what I'm going to talk about. And if that's interesting to you, stick around. If not, give me a thumbs down and move on. So um, I've owned probably 15 cars in my life between my wife and I. And at the moment, we own three Japanese cars. And um, yeah, I'm trying to think of the best way to get started on this. So, so basically, what I want to say first is that there are three major categories of manufacturers, the Japanese, the German, and the Americans. And if you analyze the automotive industry as a whole, you'll quickly find out that um, more cars are sold in China than anywhere else. But the most profitable car market is the United States. So we don't sell as many cars in the United States as we do in China, but the profit is bigger because they're more luxurious cars. And so you get a bigger profit margin on that. And when you look at the automotive manufacturers, they're typically ranked by uh, number of units sold, who sells the most cars, which is kind of a silly thing to look at because there's a big difference between selling a bunch of Corollas and a bunch of Porsches. But anyways, that's how they look at it. And um, when you look at it that way, sort of Toyota, who also owns Lexus and uh, Scion are near the top. GM is near the top and the Volkswagen Group is near the top. And Toyota is essentially a self-built brand. Uh, they like invented Lexus, whereas Volkswagen has gone out and purchased other car companies like Porsche and Audi, Seat Skoda, um, Lamborghini, Bentley. And so it, it's kind of two different philosophies of whether we're gonna build everything in house or whether we're just gonna buy up the competitors. And the other thing about the Volkswagen Group is they have almost twice the amount of employees as the Toyota Group does. So from an efficiency standpoint, the Japanese are essentially using 50% of the people to produce the same amount of cars. And so you, you have this kind of big difference. And um, it's my opinion, well, no, that's not true. Let me back up. If you look at, if you, if you exclude, so basically there's not a lot of Japanese cars sold in China and, and that's so far as I understand, largely because the Japanese and the Chinese, from a society standpoint, don't really like each other. And, and so there's a major hang up there. Um, GM got into China very early and Volkswagen got into China very early. So the American and the German companies are sort of splitting the benefits of China and the Japanese didn't get in on that. Um, it's also important to recognize that the American companies have a big home turf advantage. In other words, there's a lot of people buying, there's a lot of Americans buying American cars, not really because they're superior to Japanese or German cars, but because they have a dad or an uncle or a grandpa or a cousin who works for either an American car company or for um, a supplier, or there's a certain amount of social pressure like live in America, buy American, drive American. And it's hard to quantify the peer pressure that influences you to buy a Chevy truck instead of a Toyota truck. Um, but it is there and you can see it. I'm from Metro Detroit. You almost never find a Toyota over there. But when you're in Tennessee, you see lots of Toyota trucks. And I personally have seen people in 
Detroit marginalized or pressured or criticized for driving, you know, a uh, non-American vehicle. And when, you know, your grandpa and your dad and your uncle all work for Ford, there's peer pressure to buy a Ford. And so it skews the marketplace. Anyhow, um, there haven't really been any major Chinese manufacturers who have dominated the Chinese market, although that's changing. And China basically doesn't export any cars. So um, you have to really hand it to the Japanese because they have been able to be a world player, not by selling cars to their own market primarily, but by selling cars to other markets. Whereas the Americans kind of have the home turf advantage and the Germans kind of have a home turf advantage. Um, in Europe, you could say, although the French manufacturers are there, the Italian manufacturers are there, um, but the Germans in many ways have kind of perfected uh, the car, but, but I'll speak to that a little bit more later. Um, okay, so one thing that you see, so the reason I own a Japanese, the reason I own Japanese cars and not German cars is because there's a big distinction between the pleasure of driving and the pleasure of owning. So by and large, German cars are superior to Japanese cars in terms of driving them. They accelerate better, they handle better, they brake better. The gaps and the fitness, uh, not the fitness, the, the, the finesse and the fitment of all the panels is such that they're quieter. And so they are a higher performing car while driving. But you have to pay for that performance. And I don't just mean in the sticker price, I also mean in the maintenance and the servicing. And so what you find, if you if you research at all, one of the reasons that the Germans lost the Second World War, World War is because their tanks were breaking down and they required expensive service parts. And the tolerances were so tight that they were very finicky. The performance overall was better, but the reliability was down. And, and so what you see in the United States and in Germany, um, among other places, is that to maintain a German car is going to be more expensive than to maintain um, a Japanese car. And so you kind of have to choose between reliability and performance. And so what I have told people for almost 20 years, even while working for Volkswagen, is I've said Volkswagen is the superior car to drive, but Toyota is the superior car to own. In other words, when you're driving the Volkswagen, it's better, but you're going to be frustrated by the maintenance costs, the repair costs, the finicky um, nature of this finely tuned machine. And so you really have to ask yourself the question, what do I want in a car? Am I willing to put up with monthly repair and maintenance costs in order to have the pleasure of cornering really tight in the car staying flat? Or is that unimportant to me? And for me personally, it's unimportant. Uh, a car has become something of an appliance to me. Um, I look at it very practically. I look at it financially. And although I've driven uh, 175 miles an hour in a Porsche 911 on the German Autobahn, and I, I do enjoy driving, I don't look for that experience on a daily basis uh, around town. Now, what's interesting is in Germany, you can live a very good life and survive for a long time without a vehicle at all because the public transportation is good, the city density and population is tight, and um, there's really good access for bicycles. And so what happens is, is in, in Germany and other places in the world, the car is not a necessity and a need, it's a luxury. And there's something very special that happens to the human psyche when something moves from necessity to pleasure or, or luxury or luxurious to 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 necessity. And, and so what happens is we tend to like to spend money on things that are pleasures and luxuries that aren't needs. And then we tend to dislike, like electricity is a amazing thing. And yet no one takes pleasure in paying their electric bill because it stopped being a luxury a long time ago and just became like what we would call a need. Well, in Germany, you don't need a car. And so those who own cars, they own them with a certain sense of pride similar to what an American would have when he buys a boat. It's something special. You know something about the manufacturer. You maybe know where that boat was built. You only take your boat to the dealer where only the certified technicians who know how to work on my boat do touch my boat. And that all shifts once a product becomes a necessity. And one of the things that I told a lot of Germans while I was over there is, is you know, to Americans, cars are like socks. Like, I don't really care the brand. I don't really care the color. Like they just got to kind of work good and 
or may, maybe a pair of shoes is a better choice, you know, um, for the analogy. And uh, one of the things that I would sort of do to the Germans as a joke is, is I would say like, do you know the brand of your shoes? And they would say like, yeah, of course they're Nikes. And I said, what model are they? And they said like, oh, I don't know the model. And I said like, that's what it's like having a car in America. Like, you know the brand and the model, but like, you don't even care what engine's in it, you know? You don't really care where it's made be because it's just a necessity, you just need it. Um, so that, that, that culture influences uh, the Germans and the German engineers desire to really make a beautiful, high performing product. And uh, I once worked with a guy who used to work at Porsche and um, a customer had uh, blown out their clutch, I think, and uh, they weren't going to cover it under warranty. And this guy who I was talking to told the customer, like, yeah, you're gonna have to pay for this. And, and the guy said, well, I thought Porsche was supposed to be a race car. And the guy said, yeah, they are. And with real race cars, you have to like rebuild the car after every race. Like if you really race cars, you're used to going through clutches and tires like crazy and rebuilding the engines every two races. And so you may have bought a race car, but then you have to maintain it like a race car. And um, that's just a very different mentality. So um, yeah, so the other thing that you'll see in the industry, and I had a Japanese friend point this out to me is, in the same way that the Japanese have largely ruled over the electronics, the consumer electronics space, like Sony and Panasonic and all of these Japanese electronic companies, they feel the need to push the envelope. They feel the need to always be on the forefront of consumer electronic breakthroughs. Obviously with a smartphone and Apple, that's that shifted a bit, but historically it's been that way. And the Germans feel that same way about the car. They feel like they always have to be coming out with the latest and greatest technology. They don't want to lag behind because the automotive industry is the biggest industry in Germany and the consumer electronics industry historically has been the largest one in Japan. And so if, if you're sort of known for your electronics and someone else comes out with an electronics before you, then you start to lose that reputation. And what's very interesting is if you look at um, Japanese electronics, like look at a Nikon or a camera a Nikon or a Canon camera, very complicated, tons of buttons, tons of menus, tons of submenus. Then you look at German camera manufacturers like Leica. It's like two buttons, they use super high quality glass, super high quality uh, components, and it's very, very simple. They have not seen the need to go out and do this really super complicated pushing the boundaries of photography in their cameras because the Japanese do that. And you see kind of the same thing in the Japanese cars. The Japanese cars are more content being simpler. I mean, Toyota is using the 2.7 liter engine in the Tacoma for like 30 years now. And if you look at like the switch in a brand new Toyota to adjust the mirrors, it's the same one that I have in my 2002 Tacoma. Like they, they just, they don't feel the need to always be changing things just to change them. But the Germans feel the need for that. And the Japanese feel the need for that in the electronics industry, but not in automotive. And so you can kind of see how they're both in these two really lucrative industries, but they're taking two different approaches. Um, yeah, so the next thing I wanna say is that, uh, I heard someone say this once, and I, so far as I know it's true, it's, it's pretty interesting. They said, um, when, when you're hosting a party and you're providing the food, your focus uh, reveals where you're at in the socioeconomic ladder. So bear with me. So basically she said, if you're kind of at the lower level of the socioeconomic uh, scale, when you provide food for people, your main priority is not to run out of food. So you have like a huge quantity of food. And my friend Candace, who told me this, she said her mom was that way. She said like, they always, she, her mom always talked about like, oh, I hope we have enough food for the party and I'm gonna make sure we have enough food for the party. And then during the party, she would say like, there's tons of food, everybody eat up, we won't run out. Because when you're close to poverty, you're concerned about running out of food. And so your goal is to not run out of food. She said, then when you move up the socioeconomic ladder a little bit, you begin to focus on the quality of food. Like, oh, this is US beef, or this is, you know, uh, you know, hormone-free chicken. And, and so you take the focus off of the quantity of food and you put it on the quality of the food because you have a little bit more money. And so you're, you, you can buy not just, you, you, you can buy higher quality stuff, right? And then the last phase, when you're at the height of the socioeconomic ladder, when it comes to food and hospitality, is the presentation of the food. And that's where, you know, you get, 
you know, you, you cut the beef in a very certain way so that it lays on the plate and you have the garnish and you have, you know, basically the food looks beautiful. And um, there's someone in my life who puts a lot of focus on those things. And, um, and so you see this trend. And I think you see the same trend in the automotive world. Like there was a time when just putting an engine transmission and chassis with a body, like that's what it took to be a manufacturer. And, and now we've moved, we've moved into this refinement phase of automotive engineering where, you know, we want like the panels inside the interior of the car to fit together so precisely and, and with parallelism that it's just like beautiful aesthetically to look at. And what has happened what I've seen is, and I've seen this, I've seen this in the hospitality world, but also in the automotive is like, you're, you're so focused on the presentation of the food that you run out of food. You didn't even, you didn't even make sure that everyone got something, um, or the food is served cold, uh, and doesn't taste as good because you were so fixated on like the garnish and the presentation. And I think you see that in automotive as well, where you have some manufacturers who are, focused on like the minutia and the details and, and they're really fixated on getting these details that have largely been neglected historically. It's like we now have the capacity not just to put an engine and transmission in a vehicle and get it to move, but now we can get things to just be like so precise no matter where you look. It's beautiful welds and and so you kind of lose sight of like the boulders and you're focused on the pebbles. And I think that's why um, some companies can come in and disrupt the industry because they just go back to the basics. And it's like, well, we just want to serve a lot of high quality food versus like all the details in the garnish. I think that's one of the things that the Koreans have done uh, well is um, they've kind of ignored a little bit like panel gaps and fit and finish and paint quality. And, and they've really just made a good high quality driving car with lots of features and lots of uh, content. And I think they've done that well. And I think they've kind of displaced some of the, the German companies that are, are fixated too much so on, on some of the details. And in some ways, I think that's what Tesla has done as well. Of course, that's EVs kind of a whole other thing. Maybe I'll do another video about that. But um, yeah, so I think that um, you have to recognize that performance and reliability are, are kind of on a teeter-totter. So when a supplier like Bosch or Continental or Siemens comes up with a technological breakthrough, right? Like all of a sudden we have a high resolution, we have a high, we have a um, high enough resolution camera that we can spot pedestrians and then we can break the car because we see a pedestrian. It's a technological breakthrough. And and if you want to be on the forefront of the industry, you grab that technological breakthrough and you implement it. But what in the race to implement it first, you you cut your development time and your testing time down, not necessarily to a minimum, but you cut it down because you want to be the first to market. So then you deploy it in the marketplace. And even though you tested 10 cars over 10 months and you had no problems, now you have 100,000 cars in the market and problems start to pop up. And then customers are complaining about their Audi or their Porsche or their BMW or whatever that has this finicky pedestrian protection problem. And so they lose the reputation of reliability, but they gained the reputation of being first to market with pedestrian protection. Then you take a company like Honda or Toyota or Nissan, and they basically say like, yeah, that's, that's a cool technological breakthrough, but, but we want to test it for like three years before we ever put it in customer hands. And so they're late to market, but by the time they get to the market, it's working really well. Not to mention they're buying it from the same vendor like Siemens and uh, Siemens has worked out a lot of kinks with Mercedes and they implement those kink fixes, those countermeasures into the same product that they're selling Honda. And so uh, that's why the Japanese companies are typically late to market or slow to market with technological breakthroughs, but they have a reputation for being very reliable. So um, yeah, so basically last two comments is when you go to buy a car, and um, and I'm not talking about category. Like if, if you need a if you need a, a sedan versus an SUV versus minivan, that's something else. But um, only you know that. But when you look at the brands, you you ha and and, the, and the, the country of origin, you you have to recognize that the Germans look at cars like boats. They want them to be a luxurious item that performs very well. And if you have to take your boat back to the marina every month to have it serviced, that's okay. That's part of boat ownership. The Japanese look at it more of like an appliance that um, should be simple and easy to repair and uh, inexpensive to repair and, and easy to use. And by and large, 
and this is broad strokes and this is going to get me negative comments but i feel like i feel like the american car companies are lagging behind the japanese and the german and and they've become a little bit lazy and i think part of the reason they've become lazy is because they have this huge lucrative profitable marketplace here in the united states that keeps them afloat and they don't have to fight they don't have to hunger and fight for sales the way that the japanese and the germans do and so i'm not saying there's no good american manufacturers i think that ford is the best of the big three i think that gm is number two and chrysler is clearly the worst um but but they don't seem to be as hungry for the innovation and the quality they don't seem to be pushing the boundaries and one thing that you see is that the germans are perfecting the product they're making the product really 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 good the japanese are perfecting the process of building the product and by perfecting the process of building the product they can drive down the costs and they can increase the reliability and you see that also in the number of employees at the Volkswagen Group compared to the number of employees at the Toyota Group is that um, Toyota is basically making the same amount of cars with half the people. And that's because they've perfected the process. And then the last thing that I'll say is I get asked a lot, you know, James, how should I buy a car? What car should I buy? What would you recommend? And I'll share with you the same advice that I share with everybody else. And that is um, there, there are very few brands that I would avoid entirely. Um, I mean, I would never buy a Chrysler or Dodge product, but, um, but what, what, what you want to look at is, first of all, um, I don't think that everyone should be talked into the same car or the same model or anything like that. That's nonsense. Our needs in daily life are, are too varied from one another. But what I would look at is define your needs, um, define the number of people that you need to put into your car, define the amount of cargo that you need to put into your car or into your vehicle. And, and then, uh, once you have that, look among the brands and recognize that the Germans are going to deliver performance, the Japanese are going to deliver reliability and low cost of ownership, and the Americans are going to be kind of in between there, I think, doing doing neither one quite as good. But um, but if you like American, that's fine. If you like a Mustang, you know, then the Toyota Supra is not going to do it for you. That, that's fine. I'm not going to pick up that argument. Um, but what you want to do is you want to look at the model that you're interested in. Let's Let's call it the Toyota Camry, whatever. And you want to find out when they did major model updates. So basically, typically like for Honda and Toyota, every five years they come out with a new car, a new electrical architecture, a new chassis, a new body, new everything. Um, and you want to avoid the first two years of that new model. So like the new Tundra just came out. I think the first model year was model year 2022. I wouldn't buy a 22 or a 23. I'd wait till 24. And the reason for that is that all new vehicle was developed and tested by R&D and quality assurance. And they had relatively small fleets of cars, let's say 10 to 15 cars, each department, and they put tons of miles on those cars. And then whatever problems popped up, they then fixed in the production process. But when you sell 100,000 cars or 200,000 cars, all of a sudden you find more problems. And uh, what happens is those problems are paid for by warranty. And then the folks at Quality Assurance are monitoring the warranty data and they start to see trends and they start to analyze what's causing the alternators to fail or the oil pans to leak oil or the fenders to get wobbly or whatever. And then they go into the production process and the supplier processes and the design process and they fix those things and they implement countermeasures. And that's what I did for seven years. And so what happens is those countermeasures take time to implement and the problems take time to analyze. And so what you'll typically see um, things in the industry are looked at called claims per thousand. So if I sell a thousand cars and after a year, five customers have a problem with the alternator, then my alternator is failing at five claims per thousand. And, um, the quality assurance teams will work on any problem that's popping up above a particular threshold and, um, something like one claim per thousand. So 0.1% of the production. And uh, what you'll typically see is that, let's say you introduce a new model in 2022, your 2022 claims per thousand at 12 months in service will, let's say, be 500 claims. So basically half the customers you sold the car to have a problem within a year of ownership. Then the next model year, it'll be about half that. Um, and then depending on where you started the following year, it might be half that again. So I know one particular example I won't name. Uh, for fairness to the company, but I know one particular example, I, I did the data analysis myself, and basically the first 
model year was like 1,200 claims per thousand. So that means every customer had 1.2 complaints within the first year of ownership. And then the next year they had 600 and the next year they had 300. And that's because quality assurance teams and engineering teams work to improve the product. So whatever car you're looking at, take a look at when they started building that model, that particular um, generation of the model. And same thing with the engine, because sometimes they implement new engines throughout uh, the, the model generation and I would avoid those first two years. And um, that way you're getting the benefits of all of the work that the engineering and quality assurance teams have done. Of course, you lose the benefit of being the first guy in the neighborhood with the new Tundra. Um, but if you're that kind of person, then you probably don't care about most of what I'm saying anyway. But if you're the kind of person who wants high performance, low cost of ownership, high reliability, and you're willing to buy used and late, then that's a strategy I would use. Um, yeah, so. Anyway, 25-minute uh, monologue. I don't know how interesting that is to everybody, but if you didn't like this, that's fine. Give it a thumbs down. Go watch something else. But um, I don't know. It's just I've been asked these questions a lot over the years, and I've enjoyed sharing my insight and my opinion and perspective, which may be somewhat right and somewhat wrong. And so I thought before I'm too uh, far outside of the industry and have lost my perspective, I would just share that and publicize that. And maybe it's interesting, helpful, or thought-provoking for somebody. I don't know. Anyway, have a good day. Take care.